Okay, we are in the life of Paul. We are at the very end of his defense, which is precisely what he, he said. My, my defense before you is this. Um, he, um, uh, brethren, fathers, hear my def defense before you now. We come to verse 21. Now we're in, we're in Acts chapter 22. We come to verse 21. That's the very end of of where they allow him to speak. He's speaking in front of a mob who wants to kill him. This is in Jerusalem. They have drug him out of the temple, closed the temple up because uh, they have believed uh, some assumptions that he took a Gentile into the temple, which he did not. Uh, and as we made mention in this defense, uh, they, they, uh, there is a trigger word here, and the trigger word is Gentiles. And it is what Jesus tells Paul to do, and that's in verse 21. Depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. And this, you know, one would think that, uh, they, that those wanting to murder him would be satisfied. Okay, great, why are you here? Go far away from here to the Gentiles. One would think they would do that. Why are you, why are you here? Okay, your, your God told you, the one you think is the Messiah, told you to go far from here to the Gentiles, then go far from here from the Gentiles to the Gentiles. But they don't. What happens in verse 22, and they listen to him until this word and then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. All right, that's, there's a lot of extreme reactions that are happening here. A lot of them. And as I made mention last week, I'm not sure any of the Romans understood uh, Paul's speech because he's, talking, he's speaking to them in Hebrew. He's speaking to the Jews in Hebrew. I'm not sure the Romans understood the speech, and I'm not sure they understood the reaction, what these uh, Jews were yelling, raising their voices in the streets, because quite likely that would have been just in Hebrew too. And so they would be completely puzzled as to, what just happened? What, what just happened here? Everything seems to be okay. They're listening to him. They're quiet. And all of a sudden, they go into this. Uh, they're screaming now. And, uh, well, something just happened. All right. And verse 23, here's more of this demonstration of how upset they are. Then they cried out and tore off their clothes and threw dust into the air. All right, well, they're obviously upset, but the, uh, the Romans have no idea what it's about. They don't know. Every, every assumption the commander has made concerning Paul has been wrong, and he's going to, be, he's going to continue to be wrong. Every assumption he's made uh, th this, is, this is that Egyptian that, that had some kind of, of rebellion. And then he finds out it's the Jew, this is a Jew from Tarsus. All right. Uh, well, okay. Uh, what did you do? Okay. So, so here they have to protect Paul because they don't want this sort of stuff in the streets. That somebody gets upset at somebody else. And the, Roman, the Romans are there for law and order. They're, and when they have to put down a heavy hand, they'll do it. So verse 24, The commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks and said that he should be examined under scourging. Okay, understand, dealing with this Roman commander, he's serious. He's serious. He is not what you may call a nice guy. Okay, because scourging, this is, you know, sometimes we think of like the, the Spanish Inquisition of where we're going to get a confession out of you and we're going to get it out by any means possible. 
we're going we're to get it out of you. Okay, this is very similar to that of scourging. That's what they did to Christ before they crucified him. And that one could die from scourging, depending on how far they went and depending on your basic constitution, your, your basic health. If you're a frail person, you're probably not going to survive. And uh, so he's, he's, he's not gentle. This guy this guy's not gentle. It's immediate. Okay, take him, take him into the barracks, and all right, that's shut off from and well protected from the outside. And now we're going to get to the bottom of this, and it's going. We're going to do it by scourging. So, all right. So we uh, let's just begin in verse twenty-four again. The commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks and said that he should be examined under scourging so that he might know why they shouted so against him. All right, that's going to an extreme. You know, one would think, let's sit down for a minute and just ask. We'll start this way. We'll, we'll just, do, uh, uh, we'll just uh, give, him, give him a little bit of water and let's sit down and let's ask him, politely. But that's not it. This is immediately to the scourging post. This is immediately a scourging. All right, so he is assuming, continuing to assume, or actually he's, he's getting it all wrong, but he's continuing to assume the worst about Paul. And uh, this is, this would be basic procedure in those days. All right, verse 25. And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who stood by. And this is just a question. And it's to the centurion. The commander is not with them at this moment. The scourging was going to take place without the commander. Okay, he wasn't, he wasn't going to be there. He just wants the end result. What what is the result? So you have a centurion who is in charge of the scourging, of him being bound and all this. And he says, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? There's been no trial. You don't even know what this is about, much less if I'm guilty or not. You don't know what crime may have been committed, and this is what you're doing. Now, to someone who's not a Roman citizen, they can do this. There are, and they they wouldn't need to, that's why it would be be basic procedure. They don't need to have a a trial involved for for something like this. We are, we're getting down, we're going to get to the bottom of this, and we're going to start with the worst thing I can think of. And, and keep him alive. Okay, so he's at, with, as a Roman citizen, there are certain things, certain rights you had. And now the, the commander is going to say, he had to pay a lot of money to get that citizenship. But Paul is going to say that he was born a citizen. Well, if you knew what rights you gained by being a citizen, you'd be willing to pay the money because there are certain things they cannot do to you as, as a citizen. One is they can't do things like this without a trial. We already know from chapter 16 that they can't just throw you, beat you and throw you in jail uh, without the proper recourse. They can't do that. And they can't crucify you. If you did something that was under the death penalty, say you, you killed someone, okay, uh, well that's capital punishment, they, as a Roman citizen, they can't crucify you. They can kill you, but they can't crucify you. Those that are non-citizens, yeah, they can, they can do that and, and did, which is how they could, they could do that to, to Christ because he was not a Roman citizen, okay? Now, he just asks a question, is it lawful to scourge a man who's a Roman and uncondemned? Verse 26, when the centurion heard that, 
he went and told the commander, saying, Take care what you do, for this man is a Roman. I'm learning more about him. What? It's one assumption after another. Who, who do we have here? Who, who, who is this guy? He's a, he's a Roman, and yes, the commander fears with this because this could get him in trouble that it went this far. Now, he's not been, they've not struck him yet, but they were getting ready to, and they were binding him. Okay, so that would be enough to get him into a bit of hot water that you're supposed to um, make sure you know what you're doing and who you're about to do this to before, before you start. And uh, so uh, take care what you do. This, man, this man's a Roman. And verse 27, Then the commander came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman? He said, yes. All right. And he took his word for it. I don't know what else there would be. I'm sure, well, I do know this, that as a Roman citizen, uh, you had the right to wear a particular garment that others could not. Seriously doubt that Paul is wearing that garment here because he's in Jerusalem. He would have every right to wear it wherever he was. But there is a particular toga, toga viralis, I believe is what it's called, that you can, you can wear as a Roman citizen. Nobody else, if you're not a Roman citizen, you can't wear that. But that would let everyone know uh, you're a Roman. Okay, now, but this, is, this, is, this was enough. Okay, this was enough. And of course, if you can't check whether he's, he's telling the truth or not, you stop what you're doing until you confirm. Because you, you can't, if you're wrong, and he is a Roman citizen, you go ahead and scourge him, you're in really hot water now. So everything, everything's off. Everything's off. Tell me, are you a Roman? He said, yes. The commander answered, with a large sum, this is verse 28, with a large sum, I obtained this citizenship. And Paul said, but I was born. Now, in the uh, New King James, we have, I was born a citizen, which is uh, the understanding from the Greek, meaning he was born a citizen. But he literally said, I was born, okay, which means I was immediately a citizen. The moment I was born, I was a citizen. Okay. Um, so verse 29, then immediately those who were about to examine him withdrew from him. So the interrogators leave whoever was to, to handle the, uh, the whip leaves. And the commander was also afraid after he found out that he was a Roman and because he had bound him. That was unlawful for them to do. That was taking it too far. Now, as we have seen in Acts chapter 16 with Paul and Silas in Philippi, you had the officials who were terribly afraid of what they had done because they didn't realize both Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. They didn't know. And Paul and Silas could have raised a ruckus over it, but they don't. And the same thing is going to be true here. He could, have, he could have raised a complaint about this, a legal complaint, but he doesn't. He doesn't do it. Um, now, we come to the next bad decision of the commander. He is making bad decisions. And, I mean, who am I? Who am I to say? Except that I'm, I'm looking at this from extraordinary hindsight and, and from the biblical text. Okay, uh, he's been making bad decisions. The scourging was a bad decision. I think it was a strange decision to let Paul speak. I'm glad that he did in front of the mob, to speak in front of the mob, uh, because uh, this mob wanted him dead. 
usually what you do is you shelter that person and uh, he, he, the likelihood is he's only going to intensify the rage, which in essence is what happened once we get to, to verse 22. Okay, that's because now they're, they're shredding their clothes and they're raising up, throwing dust up in the air and showing how angry and distraught they are. Okay, now we come to his next bad decision, but he doesn't know. He, and, and I'm not being cruel to him, and I'm not being you know, overly as though I would have made a better decision. I can't say that I would. But he, he doesn't know, but this is a bad decision. Verse 30, the next day, because he wanted to know for certain while he, why he was accused by the Jews, he released him from his bonds and commanded... Now, so he's, he's being kept in the barracks for his safety. Now, he's a Roman citizen, so they can't really imprison him, but for his safety and that they don't know what he's done. Or he's, they, they have to keep him confined. So they released him from his bonds and commanded the chief priests and all their council to appear and brought Paul down and set him before them. So they're taking Paul, this is the commander and his troops, taking Paul out of the barracks to go to the, uh, where there will be the, the chief priests and their council. This is... Now, where exactly this is, I don't know. I can't tell you where it is. But it can't be, it's unlikely it's at the temple. And I will tell you why. Because the Romans are going to be there in full force. They're not about to just say, okay, y'all, y'all see to it. And, you know, uh, bring him back when you're done. They're not about to do that. And, and we're going to see where, yeah, the commander is, is there and his troops are there. But this is Jerusalem. And um, once again, this is a bit of a decision of if you want to know what the accusation is, keep Paul over here and you go inquire or send somebody. Send somebody who can, who can go and inquire, what is all this about? Ta- let them go to the council. Let them go to, to the chief priests. Uh, in, and, uh, or have them send somebody over to tell you, you know, what's going on. But he doesn't. He takes Paul and sets him before them. Now this, they, I'm telling you, they were set to abuse him because he says nothing. Well, he says words, but what he says amounts to nothing. I mean, he's just basically going to give them respect and then give a summation of his life in just a few words that he's lived in all good conscience before God. All right, that's all he's doing. And what do you get for that? He said nothing against them. He hasn't stated going to the Gentiles. He hasn't spoken a single word about Jesus of Nazareth, though they allowed him to to say that name and to quote Christ. But look, okay, so we're in chapter 23, verse 1. Then Paul, looking earnestly at the council. So this isn't menacingly. This isn't looking down his nose at them in any kind of pride or arrogance. He, this isn't smugness. He's looking at them earnestly and he does respect them. He respects their position. But more so, and I think it is more so, he sees human souls. I think this is more so. He sees human souls. He looks at them earnest, earnestly at the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. So what offense did he make? None. He says, men and brethren. That is a sign, that is a sign of respect. 
And this, these, isn't, these are not the words of some firebrand or some rebel rouser or someone who's, who is uh, just trying to aggravate them and incite them into something. He's, he's not doing that. He, there, there's nothing. He just said nothing. First off, it was words of respect. Next is his own personal opinion and a beginning of his defense. Again, a beginning of his defense. And he can't have a personal opinion the defendant can't have a personal opinion about himself? How do you plead? Not guilty. Wham! I mean, imagine, because that's what's going to happen. Now, he doesn't, no one asks him how he pleads. He doesn't say, I'm, I'm not guilty of anything. He just says, I've lived in all good conscience. Then, this is an extreme and unnecessary action. And verse 2, And the high priest Ananias commanded that those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. They punch him or they slap him hard. Okay, why? Why? I mean, with the Romans there, that's got to be a curious thing. And once again, I don't think the Romans really can comprehend everything going on. Now, they'll understand somebody getting punched in the mouth, but what offense did he make? They don't know. But realistically, there was none. He just opened his mouth. That's all he did. And, and well, and you get punched in the mouth for doing that. I tell you, they were set to abuse him. These are not good men. They're not good. They were set to, to, to do this to him, to, to just, we're going we're gonna to give him the, everything that we can. Okay, so we, go, we now go to uh, verse 3. And then Paul said, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall, for you sit to judge me according to the law, and do you command me to be struck contrary to the law? Now, I could see them striking him for that. I could see that. But what he said was actually, he is mentioning uh, Exodus twenty two twenty eight. I'm sorry, no, no, no. He's he's not he's not mentioning that. That's the in in a second. He will be doing that. But this is he's. What is a whitewashed wall? Well, that is a very similar image. Very similar. It means hypocrite is what it means. What, when Jesus talked about whited sepulchers. Now, a sepulcher is not a wall. A sepulcher is a coffin uh, where you would have, you'd have a, a dead body in it. What's a, a whitewashed uh, sepulcher? Well, it is beautiful on the outside, but on the, on, as Jesus explains, but on the inside, it's full of dead men's bones. Okay, this is a similar thing. A whitewashed wall is... One where it looks nice, it looks clean, but it's not. It's not at all. It's their righteousness is just a facade. It's, it's just a coat of paint. That's all it is. Nothing more than that. There's, it, it's, it's no deeper than that. But then he says, and, and it is hypocrisy. He, he does he does say that correct. It is hypocrisy. You sit here to judge me according to the law, but you're not following the law. You just did something against the law. Now, what kind of judge are you? Well, you're a hypocritical judge. That's what you, you that I, I have said, I mean, honestly, said little to nothing. You strike me down, you, you strike me, or have a man strike me, and that is contrary to the law. So how is it that you don't see the hypocrisy in this? Well, they're wicked men. And with wicked men, depending on how wicked they are, wicked men don't care if they're hypocrites. They don't care at all. Call them hypocrite all day. They don't care as long as they maintain the power, as long as they can manipulate people, they, and they get their way, they don't care. You, you can... Tell them that all day long. It doesn't matter. Okay, so 
who are you? You, you know, uh, God will strike you. Now, that's, that's pretty harsh. God will strike you. And coming from an apostle of Christ, oh, yeah. Uh, how much of this was uh, directly from God? I would say all of it. Being an inspired speaker, I would say every bit of this was inspired of God. That Paul isn't just speaking on, isn't speaking on his own accord or from his own creativity or anything like that. That this is, this is God speaking. Okay, now here comes a rebuke. And those who stood by, now he's not hit anymore. And it could be that, okay, maybe we, we better tone this down. All right, because what he's just said may not have mentioned, may not have meant much uh, to Ananias, but to others it may have meant something. It may have had a greater impact, I, and I don't know. But he's, they, Ananias doesn't say strike him again. And those who stood by said, "Do you revile God's high priest? Do you revile him?" Is that, is that what you should be doing? Verse 5, Then Paul said, I did not know, brethren. This is, this is respect. And he's talking to these men. But notice, he speaks of the high priest in the third person as though he's not even there. Okay, notice, I did not know, brethren, that he was the high priest. He doesn't say, I didn't know you were the high priest. He's talking to these other men and, and, and giving them the respect. He hasn't said anything concerning that whitewashed wall. He's not, he's not talking to him. He's talking to these men that actually they are, they are showing some restraint here. But do you revile God's high priest? And he says... I did not know, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, now he quotes. He quotes Exodus 22, 28, You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. And he's the only one here that's going to be quoting Scripture or even referencing it. The others, I just believe many of them, many of them are using Scripture and the Bible and their position just to have power in that society. Just to have the privileges and whatever powers there may be and the honors that may be and have a very good living that that's all it was. Well, that would be a whitewashed sepulcher. That's, that's all they would be. But... Uh, Exodus 22, 28, just briefly, You shall not revile God, nor curse a ruler of your people. Okay, for it is written, You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. And as I said, um, well, they are going to accept this because it's one, it's Scripture, and two, uh, Paul is actually saying, Okay, I shouldn't have done that. Paul's actually saying, according to Scripture, yes, I shouldn't have done that. But he does say, I didn't realize who he was. All right, verse 6. But when Paul perceived... Now, here is division. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah. It's Exodus twenty-two twenty-eight. 28. Exodus twenty-two twenty-eight. 28. And... Uh, and so it does apply. Uh, you're, you're, not to, you're not to speak evil of, of uh, a ruler of your people, which he had just done, and he's willing now to say, that's what I just did. Okay. But I, I apologize, brethren. I didn't know he was the high priest. All right. And uh, the fact that he's talking about him third person, I think, uh, is is a, an indication to me, or a clue to me, I'm taking it this way, that uh, Paul 
Paul's not addressing that man. He's not addressing that man. He's addressing those who actually have a concern. Okay. And uh, I don't know what they may have been set to do, but it seems to me like they're showing greater restraint than what was just shown with, with uh, uh, Paul being hit in the mouth. Now, we come to this, verse 6. Paul perceives a division in, among, his, among the enemies in this room or where, wherever they are. They, they could be outside for all I know. In this, in this crowd, he knows, he perceives that there is division. There's division among them. They have united to go against him. But they are political enemies and they are called parties in this chapter, as a matter of fact. Called parties of the uh, party of the Pharisees. But they are sects is what they are. You have these different sects of the Jews. The most powerful ones in, in this day are the ones mentioned in the New Testament because they're the ones Jesus had to deal with and the apostles had to deal with. And, and even uh, you have someone like Paul who was part of this, but you have the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. All right, so Paul perceived that one part were, uh, I'm sorry, yes. But Paul perceived, verse 6, that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees. And he knows what m their, their dividing lines in doctrine. He knows their dividing lines. You have those that if you're going to be a Sadducee, these are the things you must uphold. These are the things you must find passionately. And, it, and it's a doctrine of the, Pharisee, of the Sadducees. Same thing concerning the Pharisees, that if you're going to be a Pharisee, there is a party line. Both of them have a party line. This is the party line. All right. You don't break that party line and you, you are to be loyal to it and you do whatever you do to, to uh, defend it. So he sees one part as Sadducee, another as Pharisee. He cried out, in the council, men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, concerning the hope and resurrection of the dead. I am being judged. Okay, now, this breaks it apart. This breaks it apart. Because there is nothing he said here that was a lie or even in any way, a small deception. He doesn't say anything here that uh, is, is some kind of, of cleverness that uh, it, it, twisting something around. He didn't. He didn't. Is he a Pharisee? Well, he was a Pharisee. He was raised a Pharisee. Now he's a Christian. And we do see in places like uh, I think it's in chapter 15 where we saw it, of where there are, there are uh, those who came from the Pharisees who became Christians, and they brought some of that Phariseeism over with them. Okay, uh, Paul does not. Paul leaves that behind him. Is, is he from that party? Yes, he is. Was his father a Pharisee? Evidently he was. Evidently, his father was a Pharisee. I'm a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. All right, that, that takes it back a, another generation. Okay, well, that's some loyalty there. And then he says this. He, he says that uh, concerning the hope and the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged. Is that true? Yes. The hope of Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, He's being judged concerning that. The hope of the resurrection. He's being judged for that. Because you've got, yeah, you've got the Sadducees there that they, they reject the resurrection. Of course, they reject Jesus as the, as, the, as the Messiah. And who knows, they may even reject that there's even a Messiah. Who knows? But it is true that and Jesus 
as having been resurrected from the dead? They would deny that as well. And yes, He would be judged according to that. He is being judged according to that. That what He has been preaching all these years does concern the hope of the resurrection, the hope of Jesus as the Christ, the resurrection of Jesus as the Christ, and that we all, with that hope of the resurrection, that we all will be resurrected at the end. And of course, there's going to be judgment in all that. Okay, so he hasn't said anything that's false. He's, he's actually said something, actually, I'm sorry, as though he hasn't been. He is saying something that is completely true. It's completely true. Verse 7, And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. You know, where were these Pharisees, these they, because they, you're going to have the scribes of the Pharisees who are going to be shouting out. Where were they when he just when Paul got hit in the mouth, or when he was just abused? Where were they? All right, suddenly he's their man. You know, it for for this brief moment, suddenly he's he's their man of of uh, and it would be a um, it is a known thing. And I can't answer completely for Ananias, but the uh, chief, pre the high priests, and the chief priests, and many of the priests, many of them were Sadducees, and I have a feeling that Ananias was a Sadducee, and now we just witnessed a Sadducee uh, commanding uh, uh, one of one of our fellows to be to be hit in the mouth for saying nothing. All right, and that is contrary to the law to do that. Yes, ma'am. Are the uh, Pharisees and the Sadducees, are they Romans? No, no, they're Jews. They are Jews. No, the Romans, these are sects of the Jews. And yeah, let's, let's look, uh, verse 8. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection. These are Jews now. And they are also... There are many, many priests who are Sadducees. And there's a lot of very powerful people in Jerusalem uh, who are, they are very wealthy. Uh, some of them, some of them, not all of them, are uh, uh, high, uh, powerful politically. Some of them would be seen as religious leaders, not all of them, but some of them as religious leaders. And they say there is no resurrection. The Sadducees say there is no resurrection and no angels or spirits, but the Pharisees confess both. Okay, so what else? I mean, what else did the, did the Sadducees not believe? And they, are, they really are at opposites, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. How they were able to, to do anything together, I don't know. But uh, they don't believe there is a resurrection. The Pharisees do. And uh, the Pharisees did get that idea from the Old Testament. All right, that is a teaching found in the Old Testament. Obviously, spirits and angels also are taught in the Old Testament that one can find out concerning angels and one can find out concerning the human spirit or spirits in general that uh, from the Old Testament. The Pharisees believed it, confessed it. The Sadducees did not. They denied it. Okay, if there's no spirit, what does that mean? That means uh, your life is, uh, is, will never be judged, or at least not judged for anything eternal. Uh, when you die, that's it. Uh, you, you are just body, and when your body dies, that's the, uh, you're, you're annihilated. You're obliterated. There is nothing that continues on. All right? And so uh, one would wonder... Um, you know, what else didn't they believe? The Sadducees. Now, we'll just take, we'll just take a moment and just to, to make mention that there are other sects of the Jews, but not as powerful. 
in this particular day. They're not as powerful, uh, but they would have their own following, their own, uh, their own party line, things that they believed, and that's what made them what they are. Uh, you have the, um, the Essenes were a smaller group uh, and were not, uh, were not politically powerful at all. Uh, they, one could look at them and, and see like the beginnings of a monastery of, of monks. All right, The Essenes were uh, very, very rigid, more so than the, the Pharisees were. They were very rigid. And while the Pharisees would, would actually be soft compared to the Essenes, okay, and then the, the Pharisees aren't so soft. But, um, but these are the most powerful ones. Politically, they're the most powerful ones and having a, an influence uh, on, on uh, Jewish society. And now, here in this court, or in this, this hearing anyway, uh, just to, to find out what is going on, this, from, from reading the scripture, it doesn't sound like this took very long. That a very little happened here, and then all of a sudden uh, there is a, an uproar, but, but it doesn't appear to be focused just on Paul anymore. That these men are now arguing with each other. And we will, we'll just go to verse 9, and then we'll need, to, we'll need to, to call it a day. But verse 9, Then there arose a loud outcry, and the scribes of the Pharisees party arose and protested, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. Okay, now that's an interesting thing for them to say, because they're saying, first off, there's, they see no evil, and who's to say that a spirit or an angel, who you guys don't believe, or you, you Sadducees don't even believe in, if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, who are we to say otherwise, and we could find ourselves fighting against God? Well, that's very similar to what Gamaliel said, Earlier in the book, uh, this is before Paul is, is uh, Paul was still Saul of Tarsus at that time. He's not an, uh, an apostle. But let us, let us not fight against God. Now, this is an extraordinary thing because of what Paul states in his speech in, ver in chapter 22. That, yeah, he was spoken to, but it wasn't an angel. It was Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah, God talking to him. Okay, now, they, surely these scribes would have known his speech because it may have been like the day before that, that all this occurred with, uh, with him giving his speech there outside of the, the, the Roman barracks, giving this speech. And anyone hearing that would know, yes, someone did talk to him. Someone did. But they're not about to say that if Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah and he talked to him, who are we to say that he didn't? Who are we to say that the spirit that did talk to him wasn't God, Jesus of Nazareth? All right, they're, they're not saying that. They're not going that far. But they are bringing out their own position in this. And uh, the fact that the Sadducees don't, don't hold that position at all. So we find no evil in this man. Now that is, that's nice to know. And what occurs next is uh, things get violent again. Okay, and the commander, and we'll read it next week, the commander has to go in among them, well, his troops have to go in among them to rescue Paul again because he might have been pulled apart. Uh, and um, so uh, things are, you have these reactions that 
from an outsider's point of view would seem extreme and there must be something bad going on. We just don't understand it yet. Something is causing this constant kind of emotional outburst, but we haven't figured it out yet. We haven't figured it out. And maybe you're giving some folks too much credit and another person not enough credit. <laughs> 